But you know what? It's a free country, and you can go for wherever you want, and they can run on whatever platform you want. But until they're a little bit more reasonable, they'll never get like more than three percent of the vote, which I think is what the the libertarian candidates pulling right now. But that even surprises me sometimes. Like, wow, three percent of the people in this country voted for that person. That's pretty crazy. Probably because they don't want to vote to the other. Yes, candidates. it's just like a default. I hate yeah. both the other candidates, so I'll vote Libertarian or Green Party or. Who is the? Um, her name's Joe Jorgensen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know that she's too bad. Um, Libertarian, like. Because it's like a, I don't want to vote for either one of these people. It could also just be like a catch-all, like, I disagree with Trump and Biden, so I'm just going to be a libertarian candidate, but you're not, like, hardcore libertarian. Um, and obviously, I'm, like, uh, lumping all libertarians into one group. But in general, uh, what the libertarians deal is, is uh, they want, like, an extreme amount less of government um so like a lot of not all but a lot of libertarians are like all taxation is that um there should be no taxes uh and i don't know how like anything gets done or how you how you have roads and you know hospitals and stuff like that but uh i don't know or schools uh, maybe all schools should be charter schools but even charter schools get paid by the state so are all schools private schools i don't know to be honest, I haven't looked it up that much because uh, it seems like a waste of time. But um, they do serve a purpose. They help keep both parties in check. Um, but I think it'd be crazy if they ever got enough votes to get a, a major party win in an in a actual meaningful uh, position. But you never know. Crazier things have happened. Crazier things have happened. Uh, let's see. Today, we're going to start on... Why did it start here again? I moved it back to the very beginning. We're going to start with the... Uh, I thought it was just going to be more of the time periods, and we will get to the time periods. Come on. But let me actually change this. View. Uh, no, I need slideshow. And I need setup slideshow. And I need to go here. I need to hit it OK. I need to enable editing. And then I need to save. So I don't have to do this again. Huzzah. Now we're on the front page, and it should start on the front page. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, today we're starting with geologic time. And I thought that we'd already covered some of this stuff before, but apparently we had not. So um, I was gonna say this is gonna be a pretty boring chapter and we'll just burn through it pretty quickly. Um, but it does have some really interesting stuff, some stuff that's actually uh, some of my favorite stuff in geology, uh, which is your relative dating concepts and, and rules. Um, I might find, they're not gonna be labs, um, maybe they'll just be daily grades, but I might find a couple worksheets uh, that we can work on and do in class now that everybody's back, which is wonderful. Um, so maybe we'll find some some sequencing worksheets and some uh, relative dating worksheets, which, which will be really nice. But So I believe in this uh, chapter, let me just make sure it goes back out in show. We're going to go through the different ways that we date geologic uh, formations. And for me, the types of fossils we have. This is actually what we're doing in Earth and space right now. Um, different types of fossils, cor correlation of rock layers. We used to I don't need to calibrate my thing, apparently. Is that it? We don't go into any of the time frames. I guess not. Wow, I severely... Well, I guess they get to some of it at the end, but they don't go into details. That's actually pretty nice. So, this will be a pretty good chapter. I was all stealing myself for a very boring chapter, but it's not going to be too bad. Oh. Let me go back to the very beginning. 
Okay, so we're starting off with geologic time, and they're going to start at the very beginning with what we used to think happened, um, which is catastrophism. And catastrophism is the idea that the Earth and its landscapes, like uh, mountain ranges, uh, the Grand Canyon, islands, um, were all formed by great catastrophes. So catastrophes, catastrophism, um, that was kind of the feeling. So um, it basically said that the Earth is really young. Um, so James Usher stated that the uh, Earth was only a few thousand years old. Um, this was back in the mid-1600s. Um, so because the Earth was only a few thousand years old, all the stuff on the surface of the Earth had to have been formed very, very quickly. Um, you know, mountain ranges had to have been shoved up in a matter of weeks or days. Um, islands had to come out of the ocean almost instantaneously. Um, and one giant flood probably carved uh, the Grand Canyon in, in a matter of days or weeks, um, as opposed to hundreds of thousands of years. So um, that was the idea of catastrophism. And to be fair, um, they were just working with what they had. Uh, there wasn't a lot of technology at the time. Um, there was a lot of things they didn't fully understand and hadn't discovered yet. Uh, it was a terrible idea, but it, you know, you got to have bad ideas before people can come behind and be like, no, this is wrong. This is not right at all. Um, and so we started off with catastrophism. Uh, and, and, you know, it stuck around for a while, pre prevalent during the 1600s and 1700s. So it wasn't like immediately we were like, yeah, that's not right. Um, but eventually in the late 1700s, we, we had a different train of thought. And this is like, these are like two competing uh, ideas. Uniformitarianism is what we still use today. Um, it's, it's almost kind of implied in the way that we understand things. But James Hutton was the person who published this. Uh, he published the theory of the earth in the late 1700s, which proposed uniformitarianism, um, which is just a great word to say, uniformitarianism. Uh, you know, you have the, the base word uniform, and then you add the itarian, like, a, like a vegetarian, and then you add the ism because being a uniformitarian is not enough. You have to have the ism at the end. Uh, it's just one of those like multi-compound words, which is fun to say. Um, by the way, side note, vegetarians who eat eggs, thoughts. I saw a vegetarian recipe the other day, and first off, it was disgusting, um, but intriguing. It's like banana cakes, uh, and you make pancakes with bananas and eggs, and that's it. Like, you just put bananas and eggs in a blender and, like, fry them in a pan, and, the like, the reviews were hilarious. They're like, if you ever thought of smashing old bananas into your eggs, uh, this recipe is for you. Uh but it's like, this is a vegetarian recipe. And it's like, how is a vegetarian allowed to eat eggs? Like, again, it's not like meat from the animal's body, but it's not not meat. Um, it's not like you're eating plants or like nuts or something. Um, they're eggs. Like, you just got to the meat before it became meat. Uh, I think that's that's kind of uh, skipping out a little bit. Um, but that's that's here nor there. So uh, uniformitarianism is basically the opposite of catastrophism. Instead of like these really catastrophic events, which by the way, we do have catastrophic events. We have volcanoes erupting. We have hurricanes coming in. We have giant floods. Um, none of those catastrophic events that we see today do the kind of things that they talked about in catastrophism. Like we don't see mountain ranges being popped up in a matter of weeks. Um, we don't see giant floods. They do change the landscape, but we don't see them carve out huge caverns in a matter of weeks or just a couple floods. Um, you know, it, it takes a very long time for that to happen. So uniformitarianism is the idea that the world works exactly the same way it does today, um, all throughout history. Um, and so if we see a flood happening today, and yeah, it changes a couple things, but it doesn't carve like deep gouges into the earth, like the Grand Canyon, um, then that's probably not how the Grand Canyon was formed. It probably took just a little bit off each time uh, up until the point that that you have this giant gorge, um, but it didn't happen overnight. It happened over thousands and thousands of years. Um, you know, you could go to the Grand Canyon today, and then you could go to the Grand Canyon 80 years from now, 
um, and it probably looked very similar. You're, there's going to be some changes, um, but not an immense amount of changes. So uniformitarianism states that the physical, chemical, and biological laws that operate today have also operated in the geologic past. Um, if you go into the desert and see how sand blows over a dune, um, you can guess that that's how sand is always blown over dunes, whether it's the time of the dinosaurs or even before that. Um, so to understand ancient rocks, we must understand present day processes. Um, and geologic processes occur over extremely long periods of time, um, which would suggest that the earth was very, very old. So before we even had the tools to actually date the earth, um, we were starting to understand that it was much older than we originally thought. So that brings us to efforts to determine the age of Earth in the 1800s and 1900s, um, which were really unreliable. Um, we were wrong quite a bit. They, we do have better technology today, which is radiometric dating. Um, I don't think we've talked about this at all. We did talk about uh, radioactive elements in chemistry. Um, but we didn't really get into the dating side of it. Um, but radiometric dating is how we get the actual ages. Um, we use radioactive materials to figure out how old the rocks are, which helps us date Earth and date asteroids um, and figure out how old the Earth and the solar system are. Um, so this is very important in actually getting solid dates and not just a general list. Now, the opposite side to radiometric dating, which is also called absolute dating, because you get that actual numerical age, um, it's going to be relative dating. Relative dating is putting things in order. Like, um, y'all don't know my birthday or Mr. Warner's birthday, but you do know that I'm older than you and Mr. Warner's older than me. And you could kind of rank us in that order. That's what relative dating does. Um, it doesn't give you any exact dates. It just says this is older than that, this is younger than that, and kind of builds a list um, in order of, of how old we think something is based on where we find them in the rocks. So all uh, relative dating is determined by placing rocks in the proper sequence of formation, and that's actually what we call it as sequencing. So in order to relative date things, and we're going to start with relative dating, we go through some principles. Um, and these principles are probably going to be pretty important. There's going to be questions on the test, um, and I'll even have a couple things uh, in some worksheets that you have to use to, to get to this. So we start off with principle of superposition. Um, and this is basically uh, the principle of what position something is and how it's superimposed on that. Uh, so basically the idea is in order to build something like, I've never used this, I always use the sandwich example because the sandwich comes in later uh, and works pretty good, but uh, a brick wall is really nice. Am I building this brick wall? Can I start with this brick right here? And I just like set it up here. No, I gotta start at the bottom, right? I have to put the bottom bricks in first or there's nothing for this brick to sit on. It's not just gonna like stay suspended in the air. And so the idea of superposition is um, if you find undisturbed, if they haven't been flipped or turned or moved in some way, um, but if you find undisturbed layers in the rock, the bottom one has to be the oldest. It has to have been put down first and then the other layers could be layered on top of it. Um, my sandwich example is you're not just going to like squeeze your mustard and mayonnaise out onto the counter. You've got to start with your bottom piece of bread. Um, and then from there, we can argue about what sequence your cheese and your, your condiments and everything should come in. Um, but you always have to start with that bottom piece of bread to start to build your, your uh, sandwich. And the sandwich comes in later because we have other things that will kind of uh, help visualize that. So it has to be non-deformed. Um, it still works in other things, but for superposition, it's not deformed. And we did, we did talk about that. No, sorry, I'm getting y'all confused with my Earth and space class. Did we talk about bending and folding, like anticline and, and syncline? Yes. So that actually is the same thing. We kind of I hinted at that with anticline and syncline um, because superposition says that. Your bottom layer has to be the oldest and your top layer has to be the youngest. So if I bend it like this um, in a anticline, my older layers are in the center and my younger layers are in the outside. And it doesn't matter if I flip it over or turn it sideways, my oldest layers will always be in the center if it's an anticline. Um, and so that kind of helps out as we get these other uh, principles going on in relative data. So super... 
Oh. Who's that? Hello. Have you seen your hands? No, not yet. I've been telling them, but they're, I guess they're fine with their grades. So. Well, you know, this would have been. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, you haven't got to pick it up every day. So this okay, cool. All right. Cans. I don't know. If you want to bring cans, bring cans. I'll find something to, to add to your grade. I don't have any problems with that. Uh, yeah, so superposition, oldest layers on the bottom, younger layers on top. And you can see that in the Grand Canyon. Um, they're not going to have, like, labels for you, but um, the Grand Canyon, do they have any ages here? They give you the names of them, but they don't give you the actual ages. But your younger layers are down towards the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Uh, as you go up and up and up, you get younger and younger and younger towards the top. So now, principle of original horizontality. And this really only has to do with sedimentary layers. If we're talking about an igneous rock, igneous rocks can be injected at different angles, even vertically. Um, but if you're talking about sediments like sand or mud or silt um, that get deposited by the movement of water or by uh, erosion, they're always going to be laid down horizontally. And so if you see layers that are kind of tilted off to one side, and I actually kind of have an example here for earth and space, but if you see layers that are tilted like this, you know that they didn't form like this um, because you're not going to be able to build up a thick layer on the side of a hill. Um, it might stop for a second, but the next time it rains, um, water is going to wash it down to the bottom of the hill, and it's going to come down and fill out in flat layers. Um, and so horizontally is how sedimentary layers always form. Uh, we see that happening today. Uh, gravity and weathering and erosion just want to wipe out all the hills and all the mountains and just make everything flat. Um, the reason we don't have flat stuff is because we still have plate tectonics going on. So uh, rock layers that are flat have not been disturbed. If you have things that are folded or inclined, um, tilted upward, that means that something has happened. They've been disrupted. They've been pushed up that way because we know that they were all originally deposited in a horizontal manner. Um, the name kind of says it all, principle of original horizontality. Now, principle of cross-cutting relationships. And this is where my sandwich comes into play. Um, if I have a sandwich, you don't, well, unless you're some sort of, no offense, unless you're some sort of freak, you don't cut your bread first and then cut your meat and then cut your cheese and then assemble your sandwich in triangles, do you? No, you make the whole sandwich first, and then you cut the sandwich. Um, I guess there might be somebody out there who just cuts everything first, um, but it seems like a, a lot of extra work for some triangle sandwiches. Um, but the idea here is if I have layers, and then I have a fault that cuts through them, and this isn't a big offset, but you can see the layers have been offset, um, the fault has to have come last. It's got to be the youngest. Um, the layers have to be here first, and then you cut through them. Um, and so the sandwich kind of uh, example plays out that you put your, your sandwich together first, then you cut your sandwich, and the cut is the last thing that was made, so it's going to be the youngest, and all the layers that are in the sandwich are older than that. So that's the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Um, the features that cut across rocks must form after the rocks they cut through and therefore be younger. Um, and that works the same for igneous intrusions. So here you have uh, lava rocks that have come and forced their way through this crack. Uh, this is probably like a sandstone or something. Um, this dike that comes up through here, these lava rocks have to be younger because the surrounding rock had to have been there at the very beginning. If it wasn't, what you would have as your magma so if the layers are here, your magma can just come up and like force its way through. If the layers aren't there, the magma is going to come up and just spill out onto the surface and not, not have that vertical shape. Uh, we don't see lava like building a big spire in the air coming out of a volcano. It rolls down the hill and goes flat uh, because of gravity. So now, inclusions. Um, inclusions are kind of the... As far as the principles are, inclusions are kind of the, the hardest one to remember a little bit. Um, if you have a small piece of rock inside of another rock, the small piece has to have been there first. Um, because in nature, there's not any real 
uh, common or easy ways for that rock to be like injected into a rock layer. Um, and so the rock has to have been there first and then the surrounding rock has to have come in afterwards and kind of enveloped it. Um, so here we have two different ones. We have an igneous intrusion, which is forced its way up into the green layer. So the green layer had to be there first. Um, and what you see on the side are little pieces of the green layer that have been broken off, but surrounded by this igneous magma as it came up towards the surface. Um, and so the green layer is older and the intrusions inside the igneous layer are going to be the older one. So uh, rock that contains inclusions is younger than the rock that provided the inclusions. So the piece inside is older than the piece surrounding it. Um, and the same thing here, what you probably had was an igneous intrusion. You had erosion happen that brought the surface all the way down to this layer. Um, and you had some rocks just sitting on the surface. And then as more sedimentation happened and you built up these sedimentary layers, they covered up these rocks that were exposed to the surface. And so I have some more inclusions. Um, all of these little rocks inside of that gray sedimentary layer had to have been there first. Then the sedimentary layer surrounded it and got solidified. Um, and so those are going to be older than the surrounding layers. So that's the principle of inclusions. Okay, now we get to unconformities. Um, unconformities are actually kind of tough. I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly and show you an image. Um, and I suggest you just kind of study the image and think about the words. Um, so if all your layers are nice and normal and like built up in a flat manner, that is conformable. Um, they all conform to each other. They do what you expect them to do. It's all nice and easy and you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if something's wrong, if, if you have some sort of interruption or break or something looks different, um, we call that an unconformity. Unconformity is just the general term, like an umbrella term to kind of cover everything. We have more specific terms that we'll get at in a second. Um, but in essence, and I've kind of made this example before, think of all the layers of the earth as a history book. Um, and there's times when if you don't have deposition happening, if you have erosion happening, pages are being like removed. Um, and so you kind of have part of the book ripped out. Um, and then later you'll have more stuff deposited on top, but it looks like all the layers are there, but really there's a gap. Um, if you try to age them, maybe it goes like 60 million years, 50 million years, 30 million years, and then it goes down to 5 million years. And you have like 25 million years that are missing, um, anytime we have something missing, that's called an unconformity. Um, some of them are very easy to spot for different reasons. Some of them are very difficult to spot. Um, but an unconformity represents a period when deposition stopped, um, erosion occurred, and then deposition resumed. So you have a missing piece of that history book uh, that is exposed at the surface, and you have to figure out why it's missing and kind of what happened there. So. We're going to look at the different types of unconformities. So the first one is angular. This one's the easiest one. Um, so they actually give you like a sequence of what happened here. And here is an actual picture of an angular unconformity. Um, hopefully you can see this. These are vertical layers here. You can see all the vertical layers. On top, you have like an angled layer. Um, and so anywhere you have different sedimentary layers at different angles that kind of butt up against each other, that is called an angular unconformity. Um, and how that works is you start off with your regular flat levels uh, layers. There's compression, so they get bent into an anticline like we've seen before. Um, then there's erosion. So notice anytime there's deposition happening, they have water on top of that. Um, in general, if your rocks are exposed to air at the surface, weathering and erosion are gonna take place, it's gonna be taking stuff away. Um, if you have water over it, like in the oceans or in the lake, that's where deposition happens in a more permanent manner. So um, water's covering it, we deposit the layers. We have uh, uplift and folding, which gives us an anticline, um, which exposes it at the surface, so weathering and erosion starts to happen now. Um, it wipes out the top of this hill, and you can see in the next one, the top of the hill's cut off. So I have these angled layers that come up and just end at the surface. Um, so that gives us our angle in one direction. Then the water comes back and we start to deposit some new layers. 
And what we get right here at that interface is an angular unconformity. And if you see, you have history missing. Um, you have time missing there um, from basically when the erosion started to when the deposition started again. Could be just a couple of years, um, could be hundreds of thousands or millions of years, depending on what kind of rock layers you're talking about. Um, but that little solid black line that they've drawn in between the angled stuff and the flat stuff is going to be your angular unconformity. So that one's probably the easiest one because they're very easy to see because of the angles. Now, if we go to disconformity. Um, these are actually the hardest ones to see. Uh, there's just erosion that's happened. And in the book, it's easy to see because it's like a solid black line and they always make it very squiggly. In nature, it's hardly ever like that. Hello? Yes. Andrew, you're in so much trouble. Yeah. You need to, yeah, you need to practice your life. You're in trouble face. Uh -huh. Yeah. There's some students like you even gets called into Stone's office and y'all are just like, yeah, I wonder what he wants. I'm not like, oh, I'm in trouble or anything, but I wonder what this is about. Uh, so you can see they have like the dark squiggly line, but in reality, if you have erosion, it could be very flat. It could just look like you have uh, regular rocks, but this would be where you have this really large uh, missing time here. Uh, so this could be like, like I said, 50 million years. Uh, I guess you'd have to go down 50, 40, 30, and then you go all the way down to 10. And so you have like 20 million years missing there. Uh, because you've had erosion, it's just been kind of wiped out. So that's going to be a disconformity. Then you have a nonconformity. Um, don't y'all like these unconformities, disconformities, and nonconformities? Um, a nonconformity is where you have uh, igneous rock or metamorphic right next to sedimentary rock. So here you've had the igneous rock come up and have an intrusion, uh, and it's butted up against the sedimentary rock. And so you have a non-conformity. I believe on the next page, this is what I would advise you to study just to kind of get used to seeing all these. Um, they have a lot of different things on here. They have disconformities. They have angular unconformities. They have non-conformities. Uh, and it kind of shows you an example of each one of those and shows you how you can have all of them existing in, in kind of one rock layer uh, in a way. So, yeah, I would, I would advise studying this slide. Now, uh, how to apply the relative dating principle. So basically what I'm going to find sometime this week, because this is actually good practice, uh, is a nice worksheet. And I already have some. I need to see if I want to use the same ones or try to find a different one. Um, where we basically give you one of these. And you have to figure out which layers came in what order. Um, obviously, they might have it. Yeah, they have it in order of letters here. Um, on the worksheets, it's not going to be in order of letters. The letters are gonna, kind of going to be scrambled, and you're going to have to figure out what the order came in. Um, but you can see, we lay, lay down A, B, C, D, E. Uh, they get uplifted, and they get tilted a little bit. Or no, they got tilted later. Uh, they get uplifted. F comes and cuts through them. So that's your principle of cross-cutting relationships. Um, this is your principle of superposition. Uh, the oldest stuff is on bottom. The youngest stuff is on top. Then cross-cutting relationships come through, F is cut. Um, then everything gets tilted and eroded away at the top. So everything kind of has an angle here. Uh, and then you start to deposit more layers on top, G, H, I, J, K. Uh, and so you would come in, all these letters would be scrambled, and they would ask you, uh, put these in order from youngest to oldest, and you would kind of have to see uh, which direction things came. Wait, is that right? No, there's one that's out of order because D comes in here and it, it comes in after. You have A, B, C, E, and then D is injected in between because you have these inclusions. So there's your principle of inclusions, uh, your principle of cross-cutting. So it should be A, B, C, E, D, F, and then your angular unconformity if they even have a letter for that, and then G, H, I, J, K. Nice. Uh, so what principles are used to determine the relevant relative ages of sedimentary rocks? We have four of them. Superposition, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top. 
original horizontality, everything should be horizontal in a sedimentary layer. Um, if it's not, that means it's been moved in some way. Uh, Cross-cutting relationships, your sandwich has to be built first, and then you cut the sandwich. Don't cut everything first and then try to build your little triangle sandwiches. That's not how we do it. Inclusions, um, which is going to be the rock that surrounds a smaller piece of rock is going to be younger. The smaller piece of rock had to be there first and then surrounded. Um, it doesn't get like injected into the rock. What features form when the deposition of sediment is erupted? We have the general term unconformities, and then we have our three different ones. Uh, actually, there's uh, angular unconformity, disconformity, and nonconformity. Yeah. Uh, angular unconformity, disconformity, nonconformity. So the angular one's angular. Uh, the disconformity is just a missing piece of time. And then nonconformity is going to be where you have two different types of rocks, like an igneous and a sedimentary together, or a metamorphic and a sedimentary. Nice. We're going through this pretty quickly. Um, now we get into fossils. Uh, I would like to do more stuff with fossils. There's just not a lot of time. Um, if y'all remind me, maybe I'll bring my, I got a couple fossils at home. Uh, I've got a little trilobite, tiny little trilobite. And I have a, like an ammonite that I found. Uh, and we, we can look at a couple things. I even have a nice fossil book. Um, y'all would think it's extremely boring, but it's actually pretty nice. If you find like, literally, if you find a fossil pretty much anywhere in this country, especially like a shell or something, uh, you can look it up in this book and find the exact time frame that it was and the species of animal that it came from. Um, it's very detailed and a very, very good book. So uh, they have a couple different types of fossils here, petrified wood, trilobite, and a, a cast and a mold. Um, this is a fossilized bee preserved in thin carbon. So this is like a, a, a carbon press in a way. So he got covered up and all of his body degraded away, but the carbon was left kind of imprinted into the rock. Um, these are fossilized fish. Here's a coprolite. What, what's coprolite? What's it look like? You know what it is. Yeah, it's dinosaur poop. Yeah, uh, it doesn't have to be dinosaurs, but some old fossilized piece of poop. Um, and then spider second amber. Uh, amber and like tar pits and, and uh, glaciers are going to be the best way to actually preserve things. Uh, it just happens super rarely. And obviously, you're not going to get any big stuff preserved in amber, like a dinosaur or anything like that. Um, I do wonder what's the biggest thing that's been preserved in amber. It's like a bird, maybe. Um, it'd have to be a lot of amber uh, to be preserved. What's this now? Who's this? What do they want? Hello? Yes. Um, she has. We haven't had a lot of discussion because she's been doing all her work and, and, you know, being present. Um, no, I, we had a test online and she, she, uh, I don't, at least as far as I saw before I left work yesterday, I don't think she did it. Uh, I would check in between classes and see if she did. All right. Uh, I will. Yes, for sure. And I should be marking her absent, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to send her an email too and see if she'll respond to me. All right. No problem. Madison, if you see this e if you see this video, we're trying to get a hold of you. They want to know if you're coming back to school or not. Uh, I don't know that anybody watches the videos. Apparently, Brandon Yang was. Uh, we were waving hi to Brandon Yang as a class. It was fun. But now he's back. So um, we'll talk about fossils for a little bit, how they form, uh, why we're so interested in them. Um, and know that the study of fossils is called paleontology. Um, all of y'all are going to college, so I don't know that you can take a paleontology class for fun, um, but if you're into fossils and would like to, um, that's the class to take. Uh, it'd probably be more difficult than you would want. Um, just on a side note, anthropology is usually an easy science that everybody takes. 
uh that's like the study of human like ancient humans kind of stuff like human civilizations and stuff i liked my anthropology class i thought it was pretty good so um what types of fossils do we have uh first we have per mineral per mineralization um and this is kind of like petrified uh fossils in a way so what happens is um your bones unless they're preserved in a different way your bones, not my bones or your bones, but dinosaur bones, aren't going to last millions and millions of years. Uh, it's just not going to happen. It, it, unless they're preserved in a very, like, sealing way, um, you're going to have degradation there, even if it's not immediately. So in order to have dinosaur bones, and when we find dinosaur bones, um, the mass majority of the time, they're permineralized. Uh, and what that means is you have mineral-rich groundwater that flows through the porous tissues, um, and basically replaces the, the bone structure with minerals. Um, and so what you pull out of the ground is essentially a rock, just like petrified wood. Um, when you get petrified wood, there's no wood left. Um, it's, it's a rock. And if you feel it, it feels like a rock. It's like a heavy piece of, of rock there. Um, but what it helps us with is it maintains all of those pores. Um, it it kind of locks them in place in the rock record and you can cut it apart. And while the tree's not there anymore or the bones aren't there anymore, um, you could just see the structure that was within the trees or the bones. Uh, and that gives you a lot of information as to how the animal kind of developed and, and what its biology was about. Um, no, just on a side note, um, we don't find a lot of bones. A complete skeleton is very, very rare and next time you go to like the science museum uh please go to the science museum some point in time as an adult you get to understand more stuff than when you were a kid um yeah there's a lot of kiddie stuff because science museums are mostly made for kids um but you get a different appreciation and understanding for what goes on um but if you go to a science museum as an adult read the little plaque um next to the the dinosaur skeleton and most of them will tell you, and maybe even have a little image, um, what bones are actual uh, fossils and which ones they created. Because almost none of the fossils or the skeletons that are in a museum are like fully the skeleton. Um, they might have like a thigh bone and like two or three vertebrae. And literally the rest of the skeleton is, is like cement plaster that they made to recreate it. Um, so finding a full thing is actually pretty rare. Um, I believe within the last five or 10 years, um, someone in Ennis found a full skeleton of a mammoth. Um, have y'all heard about that? Yeah. yeah, it was on this guy's property. Uh, and it was like a really, really rare find. I think it was only like maybe the second or third, um, complete mammoth skeleton, uh, ever found in this part of the world. So, uh, they are, they're very, very rare. So. Uh, Permineralization is when rock replaces the bones or the wood, um, and that's how you get your fossil. Now, we have casts and molds. Um, this is essentially when an impression is made in the surface of the mud or, or whatever sediment is coming up. Um, and so the mold is going to be the impression itself, and then a cast is going to be when you have uh, the spaces inside filled. So think of like a, a nautilus shell or a clam shell. Um, if the mud fills in the inside of the clam, that part is going to be the cast. If the shell itself like presses into the mud, that part is going to be the mold. So you can have a cast and a mold together, um, or you can have one without the other. Um, it does get a little bit confusing in your brain because a cast that we use on our hands is kind of a different term. Um, the cast goes on the outside where fossils... The cast is on the is the stuff that fills in the inside. The mold is what goes on the outside. So think more like the term uh, "you broke the mold." Um, the mold is the outside that kind of shapes the. Uh, I guess in this case it would be a statue. Uh, the mold is what shapes the statue, and the statue itself on the inside is the cast. So carbonization. We saw the picture of the bee that was carbonized. Um, basically, everything degrades down. Um, and the only thing that's left behind is the carbon that's inside your body. We're all carbon-based life forms. Um, and so you get this thin, 
layer of carbon that gets that remains in between the two sediment layers. Um, and usually you get a lot of detail from that. When we see carbonized fish or birds, um, sometimes we can see like the feather structures. Uh, we can see their very tiny, thin bones. If you've ever eaten fish and gotten a fish bone in your mouth, they're very, very thin. Um, has anybody had that? Y'all are lucky. Um, yeah, they're very thin and very sharp. And you can see, oh, like fish bones aren't going to get preserved like dinosaur bones are. Um, and so we get a lot of fish stuff in, in carbonization. Uh, but it's just kind of almost this like dark black impression that gives you a lot of detail. Sometimes uh, scales, sometimes uh, like lizard skin or bird feathers. There's all sorts of stuff. So um, amber, we all know about the amber. We watched Jurassic Park. Um, a bug or a spider or some sort of small creature. I think I've even seen one with like a, uh, a, like a gecko or a small lizard um, gets trapped in tree sap. The tree sap hardens and uh, we call it amber as a hardened uh, uh, material. And this is actually something where depending on how it works, uh, the original body material is maintained. Um, decomp decomposition doesn't happen. You can have internal organs, you can have musculature, uh, it, it kind of gets sealed up and there is, there's very little degradation, uh, degradation. Uh, and so it's, it's almost uh, original preservation. There's no replacing of anything. Uh, you get a very, very accurate, um, you know, animal that's preserved there. It's hard to get into and remove without damaging it, but it is there. Uh, and then we have trace fossils. Has anybody been down to Trace Rios or Glen Rose uh, and seen the dinosaur footprints? That's going to be trace fossils. Um, tracks in the, the dirt, burrows, uh, poop fossils, uh, gastroliths are like uh, rocks that some animals have in their stomach. Uh, I think goats have, uh, they like eat rocks and it helps them grind up their, their food on the inside. If you're a Harry Potter fan, what did they call them? Uh, Bezoars. Yes. So everybody have a nice day. We'll we'll pick this up tomorrow. What slide am I on? Nineteen. 19.